I am so excited about our next speaker, uh, Steve Jervetson, who is a partner at Draper Fisher Jervetson. Uh, Steve uh, actually hopped in for us at the last minute, and uh, I am uh, forever grateful to him. Uh, you know, Steve is, is the kind of guy, I, I know it's, it's the, the, the life I would like to have. You look at this guy, he's like extremely brilliant, very friendly, uh, and he has his finger somehow in basically all the cool technology you could ever think of, uh, be it uh, quantum computation, be it uh, space exploration, be it electric cars, be it clean energy. Um, and I, I don't want to say a lot because I just want him to have as much time as possible. So everyone, please welcome Steve Jefferson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me OK if I walk around? Cool. Then I don't have to be tethered. Please ask my clock. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm going to stand back so I don't get as much uh, echo. And it's great to see this many enthusiasts. Um, it, I, I don't quite know what it's like to have a room full of Tessa fans, but uh, it sort of feels, uh, feels like a, a wonderful place to be. I thought perhaps you might uh, like to see one of my favorite days is when I took delivery of the very first Model S, and maybe that's the reason I'm here. I'm sure you can imagine how incredible it is to see the update photos up on the top when the aluminum frame was first stamped out. That's in Fremont on the far upper left, the sun tanning, the paint job in the paint shop, and then the, the little robotic trucks that take them around with each of the painted components. And then at the bottom at Deer Creek headquarters with the employees there and with JB holding the license plate, which says Tesla S1 and uh, and a bunch of other, well, everyone in the, in the photo is a Tesla employee. But, but there's some details that are really fun to look if you see it at full res, which is any missing employees, someone's holding up a little paper print out of their face so they, they could be there <laughs> if they happen to be on the road that particular day. So here's another way that I prepared for today's talk. What would you be interested in? Well, it turns out there was a peculiar little advertising network firm. These are the, you know, these cheesy companies that figure out what ads to match to people based on what they're interested in. And they found over 180,000 Tesla fans. So these aren't necessarily customers, but people that somehow in their deductive reasoning are fans of the Tesla Model S in particular. And then they look at a cross-correlation of how they compare to the population at large. And certain things might not surprise you, an interest in traffic congestion, but there's some really, oh, and the one that I love is a 42X higher than usual interest in SpaceX. So I'll show a few slides on SpaceX, just guessing that that might be of interest via the Elon Musk transitive property. And uh, then there's the weird ones, uh, six times higher than usual interest in Victoria's Secret. <laughs> I like you people. You have good interests. And New Jersey. Thank you, Chris Christie. Um, <laughs> that's up there more than anyone normally would care about New Jersey. So um, I don't know that I have any slides of Victoria's Secret, but I'll say a few words about SpaceX at the end if I have time. But first, technology. So I'm a venture capitalist. We invest in startups. Uh, I love the introduction because it is true. I pinch myself and wonder how is it that we can be investing in so many cool technologies um, when I started in 1995, it was software, semiconductors, and biotech. That's all that the venture industry did. The idea that you would invest in automobiles or rockets or satellites or robots or drones or any of these cool things was generally perceived as folly. And every attempt to invest in those sectors failed, right? There hasn't been a successful startup investment in the automotive sector since Henry Ford, right? And so it was a proven way to lose money. And so, you know, if we were wise, we just stayed away, and most venture capitalists did. But this fellow, Gordon Moore, who I've had the luxury to meet and go salmon fishing in Half Moon Bay with, um, you know, he has this eponymous law. And of course, you know it, but not many people have seen both his original version and then the version that really seems more profound. Oh, we jumped the slides, right? The original version, 1965, Electronics Magazine. What's astounding about this is, uh, well, a few things. He had five data points. That was it. He never mentioned, I predict the following things. He just did a dotted line. And if it weren't for that dotted line, there wouldn't probably be name Moore's Law. It'd just be like, okay, whatever, a random, pretty obscure paper about a very esoteric metric unique to the semiconductor industry. Basically, what's the most uh, efficient size of a die on a wafer given a certain defect density? That's really all he was talking about. But we call it Moore's Law with a lot of hand waving over the decades. Um, uh, Carver Mead named it in Moore's Law, and now we sort of understand it as uh, eh, computers keep getting faster and cheaper every year on some sort of continually compounding rate. This is the version of Moore's Law that I love. Um, and I, I show it in every presentation I give, regardless of topic. 
So I had to include it today. Uh, and I'm curious, how many people have seen what would be called the 100-year version of Moore's Law or Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law? Anyone? One, two, maybe see six or, no, maybe 10, 10 hands, less than 10% less than of the people. I think it's the most important graph in all technology business. So what we're showing here is what people actually purchase. No one buys transistors, right? You've never gone as a consumer and say, I'd like a billion transistors, please. You buy computational power or storage, right? I need a terabyte of memory. I need a megahertz of computational power. And if you cast it either way, it's not particularly coupled to a transistor count. It's the, it's the capability that you're buying. What we're showing here is humanity's capacity to compute, regardless of how we do it. And every dot represents the best price performance computer of the day. And so we are showing here basically what can $1,000 buy over 110 years of progress. And what, of course, jumps out at you is on a logarithmic scale, which plots an exponential, you have this incredible phenomenon. Humanity's capacity to compute has been compounding for as long as we can measure it. Back to the mechanical device that took the census in 1890, the vacuum tube-based computer that predicted Eisenhower's win in 56, uh, in between the mechanical device that, uh, excuse me, the relay-based device that uh, cracked the Nazi Enigma code in World War II. No one knew they were on a curve, right? It wasn't like they were trying to you know, fit a prediction, like some people try to explain Moore's Law as if the industry was just meeting its own expectations. It just turns out that way across five different technology substrates. So the reason I belabor the point is it's exogenous to the economy. It doesn't seem to change based on anything. Companies come and go, but our capacity to compute compounds. And if it weren't for this, there probably wouldn't be all the excitement in technology, this continual disruption and opportunity for new entrants to come in, doing new things with software and computers that is now sort of permeating various industries it didn't permeate before. And that's what brings us back to drones and satellites and rockets and cars today. It's the software advances, both on the simulation side as well as the software in the product that makes it possible to reinvent these product categories and to rethink them in ways that traditional industry just wouldn't have done. So, why does technology accelerate in general? Well, there have been three books that came out in the same year, in 2011, that point out the same simple fact, that every good idea tends to be a combination of prior good ideas. You can think of these as inventions or patents or or even process innovations like the scientific method itself as an invention. And these don't just come out of nowhere. In fact, I'm reading a biography, uh, the third or fourth of my son who's here with me today, of Nikola Tesla. And not surprisingly, in that era, there were a lot of concurrent inventions that went on. And so when I grew up, we were all told that Marconi invented radio for who knows what reason. It's recently been reestablished that Nikola Tesla first invented the radio. Uh, and it was very gracious to let you know, Marconi run away with the, with the credit, if you will. But what's interesting is if you think of it this way, if every idea is a combination of prior ideas, you get this phenomenon of simultaneous invention across the globe in spades. Um, it's just the time is right. You need electricity and magnetism to understand, let's say, a certain er area of new science, and people just compound ideas. But if you think about the set of N ideas on the planet that could be recombined, as that N grows, it's something called um, Reed's Law, and it goes at two to the nth power. It's, it's more powerful than network effects or Metcalfe's Law or any other sort of techno babble you may have heard that describing the internet economy. This is a combinatorial explosion of possible ideas recombining. So in a very abstract way, you could think of humans as being vessels for ideas. Our brains are just little bags that hold a bag of good ideas, and if we have interesting new currently accepted to be in, uh, you know, powerful ideas in science or in physics, we can recombine them in powerful ways. And that's what creates the economy, according to Brian Arthur from the Santa Fe Institute, that top book there on the, on the right. It's, so it's not just that Moore's Law is exogenous to the economy, it's that technology ideas recombining creates progress, and that's what creates economic growth. Another writer, the founding managing editor of Wired Magazine, wrote in the same year a book that's you know, pointed out, by the way, that the scientific method was the greatest step forward ever in this sort of compounding of ideas growing, because now we actually have a methodology for vetting the good ones from the bad. And then, best of all, Matt Ridley out of the UK, you, you got to trust the British to give you the, the memorable cocktail conversation quote, which is uh, basically, think of this as ideas having sex. And that's an idea that's hard to get out of your head once you really think about it. Does this have a laser? Oh yeah, it has a laser, but you can't really say it. Um, it's that recombining of ideas, by the way, that explains why urban centers are more inventive. It's sort of like the cafe of the mind. People come together and exchange ideas. So within university settings and urban settings, the average person per capita is more inventive. They get more patents per person. It also explains why interdisciplinary inventions are so exciting. That's what we get excited about. When someone who's been separated off by their systems vernacular, let's say in the field of genetics, suddenly hooks up with someone in a totally different field of information theory, let's say machine learning, 
and they come up with insights that neither one of them would have had in their separate domains. That's why universities are why so many startups spawn from universities that you get these interdisciplinary domain experts recombining ideas that were isolated from one another in the past. And globalization, oh my gosh. This, of course, with the internet, the ability to communicate with people internationally lowers the segmentation barriers of idea space. So it's, it's not like little pockets of idea where you have, like back in the era of guns, germs, and steel, you know, maybe China versus Europe versus the US are pulling ahead of each other in prehistory because who discovered agriculture first or who had the wheel or fire, you know. You know the difference between continents could be grand. Now, Inventions spread and ideas spread across the globe like never before. And oh, by the way, in the next six years alone, three billion people are gonna come online for the first time. Now stop to think about that. Three billion people are currently disconnected from the global economy, and they will be six years from now connected via smartphones, cheap little smartphones. Think of it as like a generic iPad-like device or, or Samsung-like uh, Galaxy 5, but you know, $19. Every farmer in Africa, they're gonna be connected to the internet, all the online education resources, all the opportunities to be an entrepreneur globally are gonna be available to these three billion people. They're great consumers, they're gonna be great idea uh, pollinators, and I think we're gonna see more invention and progress in technology um, unlike any in human history. Let me just see, I'm doing on timing here. My clock, okay, good. So as an investor, we see Moore's Law as it sort of continues exponentially growing, reaching thresholds where something can be simulated that you couldn't simulate before. So Boeing, for example, no longer uses wind tunnels when they design airplanes, right? You don't need a wind tunnel, nor does Tesla for testing the you know, critical drag coefficients for their vehicles. They can iterate very quickly on design space with a simulator, right? Because the computational fluid dynamics has gotten good enough on modern processors that you could affordably buy to do the modeling instead of the iterative trial and error experimentation that came before. So you think about the industries that have been revolutionized, obviously computers, datacom, telecom, life sciences is in the middle of this, right? The systems biology of our bodies holds us back, but being able to re-engineer the genetic code of life is upon us. And there are many teams that are doing that in single cell microbes, make fuels, chemicals, um, food, pharmaceuticals from waste using re-engineered bacteria and algae and things like that. That's the, the bottom left category of SynBio. So that's what we're in the middle of today. We see that very quickly and already starting to revolutionize agriculture, which needs to happen. We need to produce more food. <laughs> Between now and the year 2050, than since the beginning of the invention of agriculture. And we will, but it's gonna require GMOs. Um, and that is something that, uh, that, that is upon us. It, it's probably in the near future, robots and AI, you're gonna see more right now. It's been that point, or especially AI has been you know, a lot of false promises decades ahead of their time. Uh, probably in the next three or so years, you'll see more and more things that feel like magic when they're first released, kind of the way Siri did for maybe a month. Uh, <laughs> And there'll be more of those kinds of things, smart calendaring agents that sort of just seem to know you and your patterns. Like, are you always late to that meeting and you tend to blow off the school meetings and, oh, you said go to whatever company even I can sort of figure out, you probably mean the one that's about 10 minutes from where you are geographically. You can imagine this in a, in a driving context, syncing up to your phone, checking up your calendar, populating the obvious place you're trying to go in the nav system. Um, manufacture, so, so my point is all of these industries None of which except, no, none of these really were categories 20 years ago that we would have thought, oh yes, this is appropriate for venture capital or entrepreneurship, but it will just keep going. Eventually every industry, no matter what line of work you're in, will be revolutionized by information technology if it hasn't already. And by revolutionized, I mean, if you say, what is the basis of competition between whatever it is I do for a living and my competitors, it's gonna be the way you process information. It's not gonna be how strong you are or your capital base necessarily. And, and that's gonna be a great, opportunity for you know, folks who are interested in technology and progress. Now, um, just one interesting example is Rodney Brooks out of MIT um, and uh, 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 Robot Baxter that, uh, uh, that I also have the first unit of in our office. And, and the reason is it's like an Apple II. It's like a, just, like a, you just get one. At today's dollars, it's just like you would decide to buy an Apple II before you know what you wanna use it for. Because you just pull it out of the box, plug it in a 110 outlet, and you just move the arms to teach it how to do things. You don't program anything. And so my son programmed our robot to move little Tesla Roadsters around between um, a bunch of Hot Wheel tracks. And, uh, and everything's in sort of software, like the hands can't hit each other, it figures out how not to, you know, how to, how to optimize. And all you do, let's say, as an unskilled laborer, 
uh, is uh, show the robot the mind-numbing job you might be doing, like putting objects in boxes in a pick and plaque facility at, at Amazon.com. And the robots bring the stuff, but there's still a human wearing a headset that says, take A3, put it into B4. I mean, literally like a switchboard operator back in the day. And that human is just doing this all day long with, you know, not knowing what they're doing, just hearing the instructions. It, it's, I hope they get video of that experience, like, a, like an eight-hour stretch of a normal day, so one day we look back and, and marvel at what was considered a, a good job. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of small, but Tesla just had a couple of these uh, uh, installed, and they have a little Tesla badge in the bottom right corner. Um, and I think they'll fit in with the nice red Kuka robots that are everywhere else. Um, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, so what's my point about showing this? It's not a high throughput, you know, precise robot. It's something that's kind of kludgy, not quite even competitive with existing industrial robots. But like the Apple II to the mainframe, it's a different way of looking at it. It's a crazy little price point, a robot that's safe to operate around. You don't have to coordinate it off. It can bump into you and work in and among you, and it doesn't sort of get in the way of things. It, um, it could be a big breakthrough in robotics, and the point is once this hardware design is done, we don't change the hardware. It's all software from here on out. Right? It's, it's trivial hardware cost, just like the smartphone. You don't expect the user interface physically to change. You expect the software and services to just get better and better for your smartphones. We don't even think about it. But I mean, it was only like 10 years ago, like, is the Nokia phone or the Motorola phone or the Sony phone physically the way it laid out buttons and hardware? That's what defined each generation of phone, and it's all software now. That software goes into cars. Um, actually, that's, yeah, that's my car next to uh, the Google latest uh, you know, version that they, they had to switch from the Prius because they changed the, um, the way the OCD um, readout works on the analog braking system. That's how they get the accurate read on it. In the old time, remember, they had a clamp and a big contraption on the wheel. Then Prius for a while had a version you could use. Now they have to switch to this vehicle. And of course, they're going to build their own. And they're going to put that spinning Velodyne down into the mirror, the rear, uh, each uh, rear mirror. So you have two cheap ones. And the whole cost of everything it takes to build a normal car into a, one of these kind of things would be less than $1,000 uh, cost of goods to start and then coming down dramatically over time. So the point being is, um, I think these vehicles have been safer than some drivers for a while now. So three years, I've been, so I've been behind the wheel and I've been in these things several times, highway and um, suburban. And even three years ago, I promise you that vehicle is safer than my parents who are driving. <laughs> oh my gosh, and my son can tell you, when, when Papa Tony's driving, I mean, it's just like, he's old and I'm backing up and I'm not looking because it hurts to turn my neck and he's just changing lanes and we're cringing. And every once in a while, mom hits him and says, you know, about that day, which is Estonian for watch out. And then he's all startled. And it's, it's, it's just, I mean, scary. Um, and he still has his license. Uh, you know, these vehicles have sensors. They do glancing radar off the road. So that I was, we were behind an 18-wheeler on Highway 101. And we could see two or three cars ahead of the 18-wheeler because of the glancing um, reflections off the road at a very low angle. So it's almost like having a God's eye view. If you were driving your own car from above, like in a video game where you could see everything, you'd be able to drive your own car better. And the computer has the advantage of sensors and data that the human driver never can have. It can integrate all mirrors, right? It's all this data is available to you. So that's why I think and I hope that my son will never need to drive. Right? We don't want to be driving machines. We don't want to be automatons. Driving for fun out of Laguna Seca, awesome. The daily commute is horrible, right? If you're in stop and go traffic, that is not fun, right? And I think the dream of the open roads and, and the liberation we all felt as teenagers when we first drove correlates with being separated from depending on your parents to get you places. So it's the ability to go to wherever you want to go as a young person that we associate so strongly with our love for automobiles and the freedom of the open road. But if you really stop and think about it, if you're in a nasty commute, there's nothing about that that makes you want to drive your own vehicle. And one day we probably won't be allowed to. Oh yeah, and by the way, I've never seen a Prius handle. That was the very first ride I took, uh, upper left corner. Wheels off the ground. I did not know a Prius is capable of that. <laughs> oh, by the way, there was, back in that early survey of Tesla uh, fans and what they like, the very first slide I showed, uh, they also did the same thing for Prius owners. And the distinction between Tesla fans and Prius fans is pretty interesting, but the strongest difference of the random things they measured was a Prius fan, a Prius fan is 28 times more likely than a Tesla fan to um, really be interested in wearable computing. So the Google Glass people, that, that's got to be their target market. <laughs> as many of you know, electric cars used to rule the roost. In 1900, they're in, in, and as well as 1899, they were the most popular selling vehicle um, in America. This one on the far left is a colleague of mine, Hey Ferris, on that quantum computer company board. Uh, that's his mom. 
uh, in Canada, getting one of the first uh, in their area. Very proud of their Baker Electric in that case. This graph's hard to read. It's a very strange graph. It's 100% bar, but it's missing like the bottom 20%. But in, it just sort of shows in this greenish category near the car. Not surprisingly, most electricity in America went for transportation in 1900. And you can see how it, it, it sort of winnows away to zero. But as we all know, as enthusiasts for the electric vehicle revolution, and I'm willing to guess very few of you would ever voluntarily go back to a gas burning car, right? Um, we know the future. The rest of the world is slowly going to wake up to that fact that all vehicles will be electric, right? This is something Elon Musk has said from the beginning, and early on, almost everyone disagreed with him, except fans and customers. Um, but I'm not even sure all the employees or all the fans or customers would agree with that statement, that all vehicles are eventually going to be electric. Um, today, probably many people in the room can see why that might be true, and the huge debate would be when, right? By no means in the next 50 years, right? Just swapping out an installed base takes a long time. How about 500 years? How about 5,000 years, right? What is the possibility that 5,000 years from now, we have internal combustion engines that are 20 to 25% efficient, wasting the vast majority of every ounce of oil they burn as waste heat? And oh, by the way, 5,000 years from now, we still have something like oil or liquid fuels that we're burning in a sub-efficient engine? It, it's just unfathomable to me. And uh, nevertheless, as an investor, you can lose a lot if you get too enthusiastic, witness any time in the past few decades, if you piled all your investment into that thesis. So, Timing is important. Here's uh, just three photos that I took that I thought were funny. Funny in different ways. So yeah, the Mitsubishi egg in the bottom maybe is the uh, just pure humor value. And this wasn't me. This was across the street from where I live. I, don't, I just love it. Um, and it was when that car just came out. Uh, upper left is the Deskla, um, and that's actually uh, Toyota, the CEO of Toyota Motor Company, uh, doing uh, receptionist duty. This thing can roll around, and imagine how long you could run the USB ports. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the rear lights, uh, this photo doesn't show it, but you know, all the lights, rear lights, blinkers, they all work as well. Oh, and kind of bizarre to cut a Tesla, but and it's not mine, it's my partner Tim's. At, at Draper University. Um, but the one on the right is also, I thought, funny, but maybe not so funny, maybe a bit poignant. This was a huge poster. I actually have this poster now uh, at home. Um, Business Week, electric cars are the future. And, and this was a talk I was giving in 2010. I was facing this poster. In, in the room were Castrol Management, all the vice presidents and, and, and executives of Castrol, which is a $10 billion revenue a year company, a subsidiary now of British Petroleum. But as a standalone business and now as a business entity, all they do are lubricants that work in internal combustion engines. They're, they don't make oils or lubes or anything else. That's 100% that's of their business. And as I was speaking to them, and you can see their label in the bottom left of this poster, you could imagine, 2010, right, before the Model S, Roadster's out, Verdict is out. Um, anyone who doesn't like the idea of electric cars has a lot of denial uh, and doesn't think that this is actually the future. And so they pointed out with some degree of a sort of um, uh, sick humor that yes, 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 Business Week, cover, electric cars. That, that was 1981, I believe. And so the point of, the, of, of their big poster staring me in the face is, yeah, people have been predicting the future of electric cars every decade, every, you know, but, but no. And, and actually, they don't look that different from some of the ones in China today, um, the ones in that cover. But what I told them is that they're clearly the buggy whip company of the future. They'll look back, you know, and they're like, what? You know, if you don't diversify out of internal combustion engine lubricants, you're toast, right? I even went further and said, it's like, I feel like I have a sixth sense moment here. Like, I see dead people. Like, this, <laughs> you don't know it. But just, and, and they were all smug and, and, and sort of like, yeah, whatever, yeah, blah, blah. You know, there's an element to which they're right. Those people in the room were all maybe 50-something-year-old middle managers that have risen up within their company to now be at sort of positions of power within Castrol. Castrol is making more profit and cash than ever in their history right now. This is the best time ever for Castrol management by any business metric you could use. Their business is growing. Right? China is buying more and more gas-burning vehicles despite other kinds of vehicles they're also buying. You know, Throughout their entire life, the best thing they could do is just milk that puppy for all it's worth if they don't care about the planet, if they don't care about the future, or if they don't care if their company exists 100 years from now. The best way to succeed, get promoted, and make a ton of money in cash flow, business as usual. And that's why buggy web companies exist and we can talk about them later. It's just, that's the way it is. And it's why you rely on new entrants to produce change. Well, there's a lot of possible change. These are a bunch of body forms, as you know, when you have a electric platform, you can do a lot of different things, like the Model S is showing and the Model X will show, that uh, you really couldn't have done with the constraints of a gas-burning car. The electric FedEx trucks uh, were interesting. They were doing test drives on Sand Hill Road for electric. I mean, when, when does a shipping company do test drives of a fleet vehicle? That's really peculiar. Um, 
the infinity, beautiful interior. Of course, you know, there's two wheel vehicles as well. Um, what's interesting though, uh, when you think about market timing is, well, where, right? How about long distance trucking? What about, uh, you know, motorcycles and what have you? There's all kinds of vehicles that eventually are gonna be electric, boats and planes. The planes probably last for a variety of good technical reasons. Um, where to invest, where to look? And so sometimes the automotive industry and certainly cash flow management were unaware of a category of electric vehicles that they just don't pay attention to. And I can summarize with the following statement. There are now 200 million EV drivers in China. And by the end of next year, without a doubt, there will be more electric vehicle drivers in China than there are drivers in America of all types. America is the largest passenger car market in the world. What am I talking about? Two-wheelers. Most of them are two-wheelers. They do have four-wheelers as well. Scooters, e-bikes, things that look like a Vespa, things that look, frankly, like a beat-up bike. Um, they've been taking off in China. And what's interesting about this, uh, and this is a graph that I pulled together, uh, the first sort of up through 2006 was done by this guy, Jonathan Weinart, who was at Chevron at the time, then has moved to Bosch in China and continues to track the category. Uh, and with him, we got the you know, sort of believable data points for uh, through 2010, and I've since done the research since then, just in case you're curious, that green line just continues up. So for 2013, there were 37 million of these EV, uh, sorry, uh, two-wheeled EVs uh, sold in China alone. It's about 90% of the global market. So the green line does continue up way into the blue that you see up there. So now, why and what went on here? So the government policy back early on, when it was flat, that was establishing that this is a mandate and we must clean up for air pollution. These little two-stroke you know, gasoline uh, motorcycles are horrible. Um, let's try to make it easier. Let's, let's forbid them in certain city centers, the, the little motorcycles. Nothing much happened, right? Because it wasn't like you're converting motorcycle drivers into two-wheeled electric bike drivers. What happened was in 2002. Does anyone know or want to venture guess what happened around 2002 to make the knee in the curve? SARS, the SARS outbreak. No one wanted to ride in the public bus. And so they looked for an alternative, and when surveyed at that time, they said they would have bought a gas-burning car if they hadn't been sort of intrigued by this e-bike phenomenon. They tried the e-bike, it was so cheap, right? These are ridiculous, expensive, inexpensive. And they discovered fairly quickly it was cheaper than riding the public bus, and they stuck with it. And these are people that might have otherwise been on a, a personal gas-burning uh, vehicle. It just kept going. They got access to, sort of like what we'd say, like access to the commute lane, access to the sidewalks, access to the city centers, and it just keeps growing. And what's astounding is how that is, um, uh, uh, you know, these otherwise would have been gas burning uh, drivers, thank God, and if only they could accelerate that. Here's the, uh, the cost comparison in, in the center, all red, the, co the cost, annualized total cost of ownership of riding the public bus to work, and the electric wheeled, two wheeled vehicles just to the left includes a replacement battery um, over its lifetime in that cost estimate. And that's what kept them. They realized they have convenience, personal transportation, especially for short distances. What it largely looks like are things like this. And I love the guy on the e-bike carrying what looks like the remnants of a larger scooter uh, strapped to his back. <laughs> this is not the Tesla product category uh, on cost or range. Um, but thank God those niche, niche, niches are being filled. And the automotive industry doesn't pay attention to this. But huh, there are 1,300 different manufacturers of e-bikes and scooters in China. 1,300 companies. Many of them are making four-wheeled bikes. They're really, of course, a little dodgy on the regulatory side. They're like, hey, it's a bike. We're a bike company. We're just making four-wheeled bikes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how that plays out, but it certainly could be very high volume, right? When you're talking about 37 million units a year uh, spread across the 1,300 manufacturers, and then, you know, they've got capacity to build a lot of vehicles. This will be very interesting sort of from the bottom up, the way you classically see with new entrants. Now, just a few slides on SpaceX, then I'll go to Q&A. Also just incredibly honored to serve on the board of SpaceX as well as Tesla, and um, there's some interesting analogies. You know, Elon had no prior experience in either. Both really hadn't faced much competition for new entrants. Both were absolutely uh, no-fly zones for venture capital, meaning, you know, this, if you want to lose your money, this would be where you invest, right? Um, <laughs> Proven, uh, yeah, yeah, proven to be a bad idea. And also just imagine being a, an immigrant from South Africa coming to America and saying, I'm gonna take, the mil take on the military industrial complex. I, mean, I can't imagine going to Russia and saying, I'll figure it out, I'll just do it, <laughs> you know, it, it, it'll, it'll work. Um, but it did. Uh, he didn't start the business intending to build rockets, right? He started SpaceX to colonize Mars, and not even to colonize Mars, but to put a greenhouse on Mars that would then create a public upswell to say, well, this eccentric, 
millionaire, or actually billionaire at the time, sort of, uh, actually a multi-hundred millionaire at that time, uh, could do this, actually have photos coming back from Mars of a living green greenhouse with plants. That, that was it, that's all SpaceX was intending to do. On the path to that dream, they realized the Russians were yanking them around on pricing, and he discovered just simple first principles that if you're just bending metal into a rocket, like many industrial tasks, why is it that the cost of goods is only 3% of the price that I'm being charged, right? How, there's no industry that, that that inefficient. There's no patent protection. It's not like a pharmaceutical or software. It's just bent metal in a certain regulatory environment, not intellectual property, but just, you know, yeah, who has permission to fly and where? It's like, this is absurd. I'll just build my own. I could lower price 10x and still have good profit margins. I'll just do that, you know? And he thought, the 100 million you put into SpaceX, you just divert for a bit, build the rockets, and still, same original vision. Luckily, NASA and the commercial space program came along. Incredible stroke of serendipity with the rolling off of the space shuttle, none of which was in his mind when he started SpaceX. Uh, it, it landed in his lap, in a sense, as an opportunity, and thank God, because now, as we're seeing, SpaceX really looks to be the future of the US space program. Now, commercial launch is an interesting subsector of that, launching satellites for businesses. Um, it's the part of the market that's free, open competition, unlike government payloads or spy satellites, where a US government will only buy from a US supplier. When it comes to commercial launch, you could have a French rocket, you could have a Chinese rocket, you could have a Russian rocket that takes your satellite to orbit, right? So you can play the market. And what's interesting is the United States had 100% market share of commercial launch in 1980. And for the prior three years to SpaceX entering the business, we had zero. We went from 100 to zero, meaning there is nothing the United States had to offer that any customer who had a choice wanted to fly, not even US customers, right? So no US customer chose a US rocket, which is kind of intriguing. It shows you how incredibly poor our positioning was. Now it's all changing now with SpaceX and, and, and some others, um, I hope, that will enter the market. Now what makes this really interesting in the not too distant future is when you can reuse the booster. This was a photo I took out at um, the McGregor test facility in Texas before the first flight of this thing called Grasshopper, a test vehicle, for being able to land under your own propulsion with these big landing legs. In this case, a very kludgy looking, uh, you know, mock, I mean, uh, test vehicle. The quote on the top I love, and for, for those who can't read it, it basically just says, and it's from Sir Arthur Clarke, you know, the great futurist and, and science fiction author, that escaping from Earth shouldn't be astronomically expensive. And a future where space flight is, is cheap and effective, most importantly will come if we can reuse the booster, meaning the big initial boost stage, the, the, the big part of the rocket. It's about 80 to 90% of the cost of the entire uh, mission that's currently thrown away after every flight um, on every liquid rocket ever made. Um, but if we can do that, then heck, you know, you could just think of it as like an aircraft, right? Imagine how expensive air flight would be if you threw away a Boeing jet after every one-way flight, right? <laughs> Only like governments, weirdos, and proto-governments would fly, right? And that's pretty much describes rocketry today. Um, now what's interesting about Sir Arthur Clarke's comment is he made that comment as Apollo 11 was on its way to the moon 45 years ago. Right? He knew, everyone knew that's what we gotta do, but no one cared. No one incrementally was gonna get there from here because that was a lot of work and if you're, all you want trying to do is get that next satellite up, and if your government customers and your other customers are used to paying the hundreds of millions of dollars, in some cases billions of dollars, averaging a billion dollars per shuttle launch, for example, why do you need to you know, do this unless someone else is? And so the whole industry was sort of in a, we'll just iterate on what we've got, and life is good. And then SpaceX enters. This, as some of you know, is what the latest version of the spacecraft looks like with these huge fold-down carbon fiber legs. On the left is what they look when they're, like when they're tucked up against the body. On the right is a single unpainted one that I'm standing next to for a sense of scale. That's an enormous hydraulic arm uh, powered by helium, not oil. And, as, uh, and basically how this now works, and it's now worked successfully twice on the last two launches, um, all the way up to when it actually hit the water. It, um, we'll get to that in a sec. But let me show you what, 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 it, what it does. It takes off, launches, the second stage separates, and then the rest of the mission is on its way and has no dependency on the boost stage. The boost stage, again, by the way, has nine out of the 10 engines and about 80% of the cost of everything, um, you know, because that next stage isn't that expensive. And the engines are the single most expensive part. So what does it do? Quite miraculously, it turns around, fires three of the engines, comes back towards the pad from which it launched, turns around again, then fires the engines and puts the legs down and uses them kind of like air brakes as well. That's why they're so fat and wide. It comes down. Basically, it comes to a stop over the ocean, and all the telemetry data is like completely under control on the stop, and then it does a soft landing, shuts off the engine. But now, because it's the ocean, tips over, of course, because there's no land. Um, had it been land, though, both would have been probably successful landings. To, it could have been just refueled and reflown. 
Um, but because of the ocean and egress of water, and the most recently, some, something that we don't, I haven't heard the full diagnosis of what happened, something broke as it was falling over. So like, you know, if it was land, it wouldn't have even been an issue, but we're first, for good reasons, testing over water. Why do I belabor that point? That's gonna lower the cost another 10x from where we are today. This is how Elon makes the prediction that we can get to Mars and back for about $500,000 a person, which would mean get into Earth orbit, go around the Earth for less cost than flying an airplane around the Earth. So if you want in your, you know, future dreams to be going to some space hotel, it should be cheaper than chartering the equivalent plane. Like if it's a seven person plane, it's pretty expensive to do a private plane around the Earth. Or if the rockets get big enough to take hundreds of people at a time, it should be the same as, as aircraft flight. There's no reason why it should be more expensive. We're just so used to it being billions of dollars, that's the way the government did it. Dreams, well, I'll end with this image. Um, you know, colonizing Mars is a big, hairy, audacious dream. That, that's not usually something that gets funding. That's not usually something, as a private company, that you would even state openly, be like, secretly, I want to colonize Mars, right? <laughs> right? And so only Elon would provide the first 100 million for that. It was only after the NASA contract said, well, hey, there's actually a decent business on the path to Mars that folks like us and other investors joined in those early rounds. Similarly for Tesla, that vision that all vehicles would be electric, that's bold and audacious. It, and in both cases, I think what's important is that the new entrant, when they think of that distant dream that is so far beyond what anyone else currently in the business thinks is possible, and they want to achieve that goal, they have to chain back from the future to the present. They have to think, okay, if I go to Mars, I gotta have, you know, a re I gotta like, minimize depreciation of my assets for rockets that fly back and back and forth and back and forth. I need to process fuel on Mars, and so let's use methane instead of kerosene because that's what I can make on Mars. And oh, by the way, when you Go through that exercise, wow, that's the cheapest hydrocarbon in America, it turns out, because of fracked natural gas. Probably a good idea for other reasons too. This idea of landing propulsively, you want to do that on Mars, but it turns out now, gosh, that for a Dragon capsule, that's also the best way to do a crew escape. Instead of having a tower, which itself poses danger like every other escape system has had, the crew capsule itself can be your escape mechanism for landing back on Earth if need be. All of these elegant benefits came from getting out of the design space of iteratively improving from everything that had been done to starting with something that had never been done and trying to chain back to, well, how can we get there from here? There's many examples of that in the, in the SpaceX product, perhaps some as well in Tesla, but I won't go into those. Um, it, it's why the new entrant sometimes will have the disruptive change, the breakthrough, the incredible improvement that no one in the industry thought to do, and in fact, everyone in the aerospace industry sort of like, before, before they showed that it worked the first time they tried it, by the way, uh, oh, that it's impossible. It's like, oh, you, good luck with that, Elon. You spend every last dollar on getting that booster back because ever since Arthur Clarke's days, we've known that's just fool's errand. The, the aerodynamics, I mean, you're going incredible supersonic speeds, by the way, like I was holding this like this, but imagine now you're going like, you know, Mach 10. Like, really, you're gonna turn around? You're gonna, well, I, come back to where you started? You know, good luck with that, right? Um, and then, and it worked the first time. So that's also a testament to the simulation software at, at transonic and hypersonic speeds. It's pretty remarkable that you can simulate that. Every employee that walks into the SpaceX office on the bottom right, there used to just be this enormous poster of Mars, and recently now there's this enormous adjunct, which is terraformed Mars. Um, Elon calls it a bit of a fixer-upper planet. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that motivates them, right? They, you know, both at Tesla and at SpaceX, employees are jazzed about the future they're creating. Uh, making life a multi-planetary species is a, you know, a goal that motivates some of them quite dramatically as a sort of a watershed moment in history for a species to say there are those that do and those that don't in the universe. The ones that don't eventually get wiped out by asteroids or you know, some ridiculous self-induced uh, disaster. And, uh, and, this is, and the civilizations that don't are the advanced ones. So with that, let me just end. Um, Black Swan drinking from the fire hose is my image of technology change. It's accelerating, it's interdisciplinary, it's an exciting time to be in technology. Students, by the way, in college right now in the science and engineering, wow, no better time. It is so interesting what's going on. We're gonna bring back the woolly mammoth. We're, I mean, there's just, it, it's fun, right? It'll, it'll soon be announced the first artificial life form with a genome smaller than any other living organism reproducing, creating multiple copies of itself. That's, that's just in life sciences. Um, and this is great for entrepreneurs, right? Whenever you have more and more disruption, which we will because of technology change, you're gonna have more and more opportunities for new entrants and more progress. And so I think it's great to be a consumer. It's a bit daunting. I feel like future shock every given year, but uh, that's what gets us excited and that's what excites the entrepreneurs of the world. So let me end with that and say thank you very much. Okay, so, uh...
let's do 10 minutes of questions. Okay, and we'll, and we'll start over here with Kip. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get your thoughts on the end game of the supercharger network. Is free for life scalable logistically and economically when you've got millions of Teslas and potentially other brands on the road, supercharger capable? So, so if I heard the question right, uh, the long end game and supercharger network, and is it economical long? So, um, I, luckily I can say I don't know <laughs> the answer that would get me in trouble. Because <laughs> right, I'm on the board, public company, can't make forward-looking statements. And, um, but what I can tell you, uh, and, and really believe me, this is my personal opinion, um, why do a supercharger network? Which hopefully will start to answer the question you asked. And in my personal view, the brilliance of it is as a marketing campaign. As a driver of an EV since 2008, Roadster and now, now the sedan, um, I would come across friends who are enamored, especially with the sedan, and would want one. And if I, I received any question, and I did most of the time, 100% of the time it was about range. And strangely enough, 100% of the time, it was something to do with a road trip. And this is just my personal experience, right? It was and legitimately, let's say Lake Tahoe from the Bay Area you know, for skiing, that, that's, that's a legitimate one, or LA or cross country America, right? And then I'd say, when have you last done that? Like, uh, the LA especially in the cross country. I like, for me, last time I drove to LA, right, it was before Southwest Airlines existed, I would never <laughs> do that again. Um, I am never gonna drive cross country, and I doubt I've met a person who's gonna drive cross country. That is just a figment of our imagination. And I know there's some in the room, I know. Well, then I'll meet you later, and, you, and now you can, right? But these hypotheticals, I'm like, and oh, if you did, you know, why would you orchestrate your entire day-to-day -day driving experience around that one hypothetical versus rent the vehicle for that trip? And if you hate it and you want to make it one way, you don't worry, just leave the car on the other coast, right? It's like, like why would you fixate on a cross-country trip? But they all do. So think about if you're Tesla, if you're any electric vehicle company, and you want to address that challenge. This is a classic marketing conundrum. It's like, you know in your heart this is a non-issue, right? You can logically argue to a blue in the face, and after you tried with, let's say, 100 of your closest friends and family members, and none of them seem persuaded, you're like, this is just not going to work. So but, how but about you take the issue off the table? Sustainable. Okay, if, I'll get if, to the sustainable in a minute. Okay. So you take it off the table. So, so here, okay, so is this sustainable? If, this, this is not the situation, but if you only offered it cross country, right, of course it's sustainable because no one will actually drive. Even if yeah. it's free, you're still not going to go just because yeah. it's free. <laughs> it doesn't change my interest in driving cross country. Right? Right. It's a royal pain in the ass. Much of the middle of America is very boring to drive through. <laughs> I grew up in Texas. There's no reason to drive through Texas. Don't do it. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. So, so a much more difficult question is, do, like, for the ones up and down the coasts, could it be abused? Will people use it for their daily commute in some way? And I don't know the answer to that at scale. Do you put policy in that says this isn't for your commute and you just can use it if you're actually trying to get linear from place to place? In other words, you don't revisit the same supercharger over and over. You go from one to the next because you're going somewhere. Again, no one has ever whispered a hint that that's what you do. But if I was in charge, that might be something I might have to think about if it was abused or just say, well, how much does it really cost at the end of the day? How much might I have otherwise spent on marketing? And as long as the total cost doesn't exceed what normal car companies do for marketing budgets, why not? Right? Once they, once, because once they do the capex, right? It's a capex thing. You have the equipment and then offsetting solar somewhere, right? In theory, if you balance it right, it's not an ongoing cost. It's just maintenance of a capital asset. So it's like once you've already built it, who cares how much it gets used? It's possible. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. So we go here. <laughs> Love the shirt. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Again, uh, uh, thank you very much for your bold investments. I hope you uh, inspire a lot of VCs to, uh, to look into those areas as well. I wanted to uh, ask a question about uh, self-driving, and you mentioned your uh, green enthusiasm on that. I know that uh, from Elon saying that you, uh, Tesla is also investing in autopilot technology. Mm -hmm. How far do you think we are from uh, a marketable, marketable uh, self-driving cars? And what do you think that means for companies like Tesla, whether people are actually going to buy cars at that point in time? Let me see if I understand the second half. Um, I'm not sure if I understood. I can totally understand how, in generic terms, how it could affect Tesla. But what did you mean by how people are going to buy cars? Well, I mean, at a point that the car can drive you to a place and then drive off to go somewhere else and maybe pick up someone else. Uh, uh, yes. Do you think that people still buy cars or they, you know, and, and when do you think that actually starts happening in your best prediction? Tough call. Because uh, I am usually, a t like, as you saw with my statements, I would take one today. Even no, I've taken one three years ago, actually. I think they derated it. Um, 
because three years ago for Google, it was uh, just a highway merge that was scaring them. Um, everything else was working really well, the same harness. But what, what Google, as some of you probably know, is actually going to do um, under Sergey's leadership now is ship this unusually looking car. It looks kind of like a Hello Kitty kind of little wagon. No, no, no steering wheel. Uh, maximum speed of 25 miles per hour, a foam front end, and the design spec is that it's impossible to kill someone, which is kind of an unusual, like, you know, failure is not an option approach to, to this. You know, you'd normally take a little risk. And they literally mean like someone die, you know, does the flying suicidal leap in front of the vehicle. It won't kill them. It'll just hurt them. Right? Um, that limitation is, is of course, uh, plausible in an urban Uber-like deployment, right? So if, if these will not be owned, no customer will own these, they'll just be operating a service competing with their biggest investment, Uber. Um, uh, and, and the timing of those two decisions were identical, which is funny. Um, but uh, there are a lot of technology packages. So the, the most of the automotive industry relies on Continental, Bosch, or someone else for the electronics and software. They've long since atrophied those skills, right? So you imagine back in the early days of radio, Delphi, somebody else does the radio. They've, they've gone down this path, ABS and all the electronic systems, where they've withered away their software talent, what little they have. This is why almost every EV outside of Tesla uses big, simple batteries, because the software is simpler on the management side. And the idea of thousands of cylindrical cells and all the complexities in software that need to be uh, controlled for is a little daunting to them. Um, so when it comes to autopilot or auto driving, much of the industry will just bolt on something from a few basically suppliers in the supply chain. And uh, therefore, the timing is somewhat hard to predict because it's a multi-party question. Like, you know, someone like Tesla or SpaceX can say, because of vertical integration, we're going to introduce something and do the whole thing. Whereas the, the rest of the industry in both categories relies on, well, I can't build a new rocket unless the engine manufacturer makes me a new engine, for example. I like to talk about the rocket analogies more because it's safer. Uh, uh, you know, and so you're, you're kind of stuck, right? Everyone's doing the same thing, and they all like within a few percent of each other. The, um, the, the two paths to market, um, the, the existing car companies typically take the safe path of creeping incrementalism around um, cruise control because it's something that each, you know, everyone understands a slightly better cruise control and it doesn't suddenly provoke a new regulatory regime. Because for car companies that are in the car business, their worst fear is that something changes that gives them liability for how their car performs. Right now, it's like, hey, bad driver. You know, it's not my fault if the driver just did something ridiculous, right? As we think about a future that the car drives itself, wait a minute, why is it the driver's fault? Right? That future shifts, li shifts liability, potentially. They don't want to go there. So what they do is they're moving down the slow and simple path. A new entrant like Google has no installed base. They don't care about effects on the existing automotive industry. So they, can, they should have and could have done bold steps. And they started doing bold steps. Now they're dialing that back. Um, I'm not sure why, other than the lawyers took over. Um, uh, the, and so the other, so one is that, so that, that, that highway only solution that a lot of companies are doing. Another one you could do is um, low speed urban, mm -hmm. where parking, parallel parking, sharing vehicles, um, also there's all kinds of stuff you could do on campuses and buses. I mean, I think the biggest low hanging fruit economically is long distance trucking, mm -hmm. but it's politically and marketing wise the worst area, because who wants to make trucking companies more profitable? And the public won't rise up and say, you know, good, let's have those robot 18 wheelers on the road. Um, <laughs> So for good reason, Google is not even considering commercial vehicles to start. Um, and so I think you'll see um, urban solutions that lead towards a rental model, because that's just, I mean, 40% of, of, of time driving in cities is looking for parking, and 40% of real estate in cities is for parking. This is, you can imagine new cities in China where neither exist. And you say, there will be no drivers, because you, know, you could have charter cities with a different mantra. Say, How would we do urban planning differently uh, if we didn't have anyone driving? You could have vehicles, just no drivers. Um, and that's not that far off. So timing, I don't know. Uh, that urban solution, you know, the, the things you need to do it will be here in two or three years. How long does it take to percolate out? Who's going to provide the capital? How, you know, just like with EVs and charging resources, who, who do, what, how do you get the chicken and egg problem solved, right? And like, if you're going to get rid of parking lots, is it, again, a new city? Does it have to be, a, you know, or is there any way to incrementally change and roll out into existing cities? So it's more questions than answers. All I know is if you look at 500 years, there's no question. That's where we're ending up. And just like EVs itself, a lot of opportunities to make money exist when you have multi, multi hundred billion dollar shifts of the economy like that. Um, and we're trying to figure that out as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, one very quick question. The last question. I think you mean quick answer. 
Any quick answer, please. <laughs> Question, okay. The questions have been plenty quick. Okay. <laughs> you, uh, you touched on this. You're thinking big. You're finding ways to make these investments. So it's practical. You've got a good filter. You touched on your, your slide there, the college, college kids right now. This is a good time. This is very exciting. Besides the things that you're doing now and the investments that you're making, uh, that's like the current generation. What are you doing? What's your takeaway? What are you seeing to encourage the next generation, your family, uh, others, as you look at the market, as you think big? How do they get into this to kind of do that Elon Musk thing, come up with something because they thought big? They weren't afraid of it, but, but mm -hmm. still grounded in, in reality. That's an interesting question. I don't, I haven't, and maybe I should, feel the mantra of I need to inspire the next generation. I, I've been a bit of, in my career, a facilitator of the real heroes, the entrepreneurs that do, right? So we'd all much rather hear Elon Musk here on stage because he's actually doing it, right? Um, I feel privileged to help him. So I don't feel like I'm necessarily the best spokesperson for how to get the next wave of entrepreneurs other than what I can speak to as someone that invests across industries is look for those patterns, those similarities, things like, okay, kids, uh, if it's, you know, my kids or kids in college, things like machine learning and deep learning are really, really important. They permeate everything new, everything that Google's doing outside of their satellites and fiber and balloons. All the other weird stuff all relates to deep learning. And, which is like neural networks, basically, um, in a form of uh, mimicking the brain and topologies of the brain to create systems that can make sense of data sets that be, are beyond human understanding and to actually build iteratively solutions, complex software that exceeds human understanding. That's happening all around us. It is the next era of engineering. So that sort of meta point is about the most I could think to contribute to the conversation because in any one domain, it's the entrepreneurs that know much more, right? about what's going on in synthetic biology, what's going on in each of these areas. So in general, there, I could also have a judgment call that says, you know, understanding biology at some level is really important and obviously computer science. Like, how do we program in general? How, do, how does biology create complexity in general? And where are there interesting opportunities using those two metaphors to cross-pollinate in new interesting ways? New biological metaphors for software generation, new uh, ways to re-engineer biology to make sustainable processes, right, because these microbes don't kill themselves uh, and survive, so they tend to be non-toxic to their environment. They tend to just be a more elegant and efficient way to do a lot of things. So um, I will, you know, as I look meta and beyond, the, you know, there are related things about a technology accelerated rich poor gap that are really worrisome that I'm now spending time on to think about what is it about the aggregate effect of all these technologies on the opportunities for employment globally I alluded to it when those next three billion come online. It's, this is going to be a very interesting time period. And is it okay? What does it mean? How can we provide for the bottom of the pyramid of needs, food, shelter, clothing, health care, and education for all, for free uh, or near free? So all physical things will cost $1 a pound. All information products and entertainment is what we'll pay for in the end game. How do we get there from here? And it usually means routing around the entire infrastructure of health care and education and starting over with something very simple that's you know, cell phone deployed. And so that's what I'm looking for is in the next investment theme. But, but that's about as far as I go because I, I, I can't be as visionary as the entrepreneurs can. All I can do is aggregate what I'm seeing as threads across their visions and saying, like, yeah, that looks like it's right. You know, I very rarely have had that inside myself. Yeah. Okay, let's all thank Steve. Mm -hmm.